Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 747. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 2nd, 2022. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, where Kevin and George flip on the old webcams and talk about what's going on around the world, sometimes around the nation, certainly around the Anglican Communion, and, well, this is Lambeth, 2022. So George and I have a lot to talk about in this episode, because it's it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy what's going on, and uh, George and I, we run Anglican.inc, and we run Anglican Unscripted. And this is our job to tell you what's going on. But before I get too far, George, you've been up since like 2 a.m. How are you holding up? That's 12 hours ago. Uh, with a large number of Diet Cokes. So I, my ankles will probably be wider than my waist <laughs> by the time I go home tonight with edema and swelling and everything. I know. It's but, uh, it, it, it's hard to do this. I mean, uh, even on location at a Lambeth, we always arrive sleep. We're a GAFCON. We arrive sleep deprived because of the time difference. We uh, um, are tired. We have to find food and nourishment. Uh, oftentimes, the press accommodations are not quite up to snuff, and so we have to find our own press room and set up our laptops. And covering an event like this is crazy. I, you know, I feel sorry for the people who run Lambeth. The logistics are crazy, but for press people, the the logistics are just as crazy. So you have been attending the daily press conferences via Zoom or whatever they're using, and um, you need to help us understand what's happening here. Because if I follow Twitter and Facebook and the stuff we are reading on Anglica.inc um, and some other sources, things have really broken down there. Um, The plan to have a system of calls and not resolutions and have people agree or not agree in principle to these things uh, does not seem to be working. And I think uh, we should start with that if I got that in my show notes. Show notes says, uh, yes, let's start with the calls. So uh, (laughs) what was the the, let's just give the outline here. What was the desire of these calls? Well, the, there are 10 uh, calls made, and calls are documents that, uh, on issues like science and technology, the environment, human dignity, basically these things. And the conference was going to have two sessions on each call. First would be a closed session, where in table groups of seven or eight, the bishops would discuss these calls as preprinted. And then a bishop slash secretary would summarize the results of the conversation, pass them to the conference chair, and there are about a hundred tables, and they would then choose six to randomly share. And the promise is that after the conference, when they carry forward on these calls, the rest of the materials will be passed to the committees that charged with taking these. So the first day, we had the call, the first business day, if you will, we had the call on a mission and evangelism. And non-controversial, nothing in it that could anybody could take offense to, not even the looniest Episcopal bishop could take offense to this stuff. So the time came to vote, and the voting uh, it was is to be done by a little handheld device where you each bishop has its unique number and then there's a a yes and first off it was either to be two options yes we like it as it is or we want more study a third option was added the first day which is yes more study and no so for the first day we had the vote there's 650 bishops and we had the vote on mission and evangelism well there were 66% yes, 33% more study, and 1% no. However, out of the 650 bishops, either 250 people were missing or they didn't bother to vote. And there was some talk that this was too complicated. And so the next time they voted, uh, they were going to do it. uh, Well, the story is each session has tried a different way of voting. And, and it's all up to the whim of the Archbishop of Canterbury. He'll say at the start of a session, well, electronic voting didn't work. Now let's do it on voice vote. 
Mm, that didn't work. Let's do it on a show of hands. Mm, that didn't work. Oh, Let's dear. do it on if you're in favor. If you're against, stand up. Okay. So if he's remained seated, you're uh, for it. And this is called of commentary in the uh, Twitter feeds of participants. Uh, uh, Jennifer Reddell, the Episcopal Bishop of Arizona, says, you know, this is ridiculous. Um, I sp you know, I'm a native English speaker, and I have a hard time figuring out what the hell we're doing. She didn't say this, but what we are doing. What we are doing, Because yes. the rules keep changing. So the calls, and nine of the ten calls are non-controversial. Now, some of them are PC, and uh, there was one call that we spoke about our last show that has a makes a hash of the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. Well, Archbishop Tabo Makoba, after that conference, said was asked about this. He said, "Well, uh, we'll clean that sort of stuff up after the conference, and because you know we'll take care of it. Don't worry about that." So what we're hearing is what they'd actually decide really doesn't matter because it's going to be rewritten by a committee. Well. There's one call in particular that has caused all the grief, and that's human sexuality or human dignity. Hey, human called. dignity is the name, yeah. And there's a, a long story about this, and I'd like to share that because that's really 95% of the news uh, mm -hmm. so far, or int uh, interesting news. If Inter you will. Relevant, interesting, oh my goodness, what's happening news, yes. The, the people who watch Anglican Inc. want to know about this. Yes. Anglican Unscripted want to know mm -hmm. about this. All right. The 10 calls were put together by a team of 50 people commissioned by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it's advertised as having women and young people and pe people from the global south. And well, along the short of it, it's basically were written by the staffers with some little uh, 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 decoration uh, and nod to diversity. One of these calls was human dignity. It was chaired by the Archbishop of the West Indies, Howard Gregory of Jamaica. This call talked about reparations, that the Church of England or the church commissioners should pay reparations to the descendants of African slaves sold and shipped to the North, to the Americas. And there was a little statement that we deplore the remnants of British and American colonialism. Uh, that they left out the French and the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Chinese and you know, but just you know we're going to pick on the Americans and the the, the British, not uh, all of Europe. Okay, all you know. All so yeah, yeah, yeah. You know we've heard this stuff millions of times. So the the calls are typed up, they're submitted, and then a booklet is printed and which is given out on. Uh, made public on the 22nd of July, just before the bishops leave home, that weekend before they're all flying away. And a preamble was play, inserted in the call on human dignity. And in the preamble was the, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this, talk about this, and we're going to reaffirm Lambeth 110. This caused an explosion. Now, first off, how did this appear in there? Well, in the beginning of July, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, led by the Archbishop of South Sudan, Justin Badiarama, released a statement saying, here are the four things we want to see out of this conference. And one of them was reaffirmation of the Lambeth Resolution 110. And it kept getting repeated by the Global South. This is what we want. This is what we want. Now, it's the, the, the calls are printed up and someone on the staff threw in this into a preamble. The liberal activists had a hysteria. And one of the liberal activists is the Suffolk Assistant Bishop of Toronto, Kevin Robertson, who's a partnered gay man. He was on the committee that actually prepared this course. We didn't talk about any of this. Somebody is changing the, the stuff that we prepared. Well, they had to have an emergency meeting. Bishop Tim Thornton, the Archbishop of Canterbury's assistant for the Lambeth Conference, had a meeting with gay activists a week ago Monday, and they agreed to drop that. Well, the gay activists aren't satisfied. How did it even appear there in the first place? Well, I've been snooping around and talking to people, and I've piecing together a story, which I cannot confirm. But 
the gist of it is the staff said, ah, here's a way to mollify the global south and keep them quiet. We'll put in a preamble with what they want. However, when we vote, we don't vote on the preamble, we vote on the text of the call itself. And these poor dumb Africans aren't going to be able to figure it out. So they'll think we're reaffirming Lambeth 110 when really we don't, we're not because we're not voting on the preamble. Well, the poor dumb people this time around were not the uh, non-English speaking Africans. They were the but woke the liberals. <laughs> the, the woke liberals. Jeez. The woke liberals. Yes. Who couldn't distinguish from the bureaucratic gains of putting in something that is not part of the whole, but is not going to be acted upon, just a bit of an, uh, an exclaimer, um, excla- uh, explanation. Okay. Well, the Global South for about three months now has been planning on bringing to the conference a vote on the Lambeth 110 resolution. And they were pleasantly surprised when they saw it appear, but they still were going to go ahead and ask for it Mm -hmm. because they didn't quite trust the process. Well, why why would that be? They asked, (laughs) well, on uh, Friday, they asked a uh, Thursday, I think it was, they asked for a meeting with Justin Welby to share with them that they were going to bring this forward into the into to the conference. They're going to ask for an up and down vote. And they were promised a meeting, it was postponed, promised a meeting, postponed, postponed four times until Saturday night after the Sunday papers have already been put to bed. Justin Welby then met with them. And he met with seven primates from the Global South led by the Archbishop of South Sudan, Justin Badiarama, and James Wong, the Archbishop of the Indian Ocean. And they asked for four things, the Global South. Reaffirmation of Lambeth 110. They wanted five minutes on Monday's closed session to share why they felt Lambeth 110 needed to be reaffirmed. Second, they wanted a separate worship space because they could not work conscience with those bishops who had deliberately and knowingly violated Lambeth 110, or with the six bishops who had their partnered gay spouses with them. Even though they're not supposed to be here, they can come and worship and they can eat in the dining rooms, they just can't take part in the spouses' activities. So the separate worship. Third is they wanted a list of everybody here because they wanted to make sure they could basically contact all the people who are on their side. And fourth, they wanted these votes to be recorded by individual roll call votes. Justin Welby's immediate response, and I was not present, I can only repeat what I have told by those who have knowledge of multiple sources who were in the meeting, yes. Yes. Or were senior aides to to those in the meeting who we're part of the briefing and all this and that. Mm -hmm. And no, we're not going to reveal who it is. Um, We don't have to. We, uh, Justin Welby, countered with, well, I'll write a letter reaffirming Lambeth 110. And if we do that, then you won't need five minutes because it'll be a moot point because won't you be happy to take home a letter from me saying Lambeth 110 is the law of the land? And it's too, second, it's too late to set aside a place for tomorrow's Sunday worship, but we'll see what we can do for the closing service the following Sunday, and we'll see about the other stuff. Well, the next day comes, and early on Sunday morning, we have the worship service. Well, not early, nine o'clock. Early for me. <laughs> me uh, <is> early. <laughs> Jeez. Early for me, uh, 4 a.m. Uh, and we have the worship service. The Global South primates remained in their seats, as did a number of their fellow bishops for Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. So we had the boycott. They didn't make a scene. They didn't all sit, you know, they didn't sit in blocks or anything like that, but they could, you know, in good, not in good conscience, participate with someone whom they're not in love and charity with their neighbor because they believe their neighbor is violating God's word. In an unrepentant way, yeah, absolutely. In yes. an unrepentant way. Yeah. Then at the first plenary, Justin Welby says, Well, 
we're no longer going to use these mechanical devices because electronic devices because a third of the bishops didn't use them in the last vote and so we'll just do it by voice vote now everybody with me on that and everybody said yay <laughs> well what happens now to the global south's demand for a rec record record of each vote yeah it's out on. the window because we're not keeping a record and no we're not going to be able to give you a copy of who's here the justin welby then gives the draft of his letter and we see the final version was released this morning which we printed on anglican ink it's a lawyerly letter it's a it's mess written by lawyers. oh it's a mess it's confusing mm -hmm. and what justin welby and essentially on sunday the Global South primates turned down this letter. They said, Good. no, this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Welby's letter basically affirmed the historical fact of 1998's Lambeth Conference voted on 110. But he did nothing to say that it is still uh, lo living doctrine, if you will. He couched it in such mealy-mouthed, lawyerly language that both sides could see this as helping them or both sides could see this as being offensive to them but it was ac unacceptable so we have more deliberations with Welby and the primates and they can't come to an agreement and the global south held firm and Welby pulled out all the stops you're basically wrecking the conference um you're a uh, tool of gafcon so on and so forth um you uh we're trying to walk together in unity and continue the conversation and here you you're calling for up or down black and white resolution of an issue that is unclear to which the global south responded it's perfectly clear and and uh, this is where i need to stop and, and let the audience know um justin has been very I don't, want, I don't want to say, but he's either lying or he doesn't know the truth here. The truth here is we've gone through this process many times. The Winds reports, the, the primates communiques since 2003, if not earlier, uh, since 2001. Um, we did not arrive at this without having a good in, uh, discussion at a very high level amongst the primates. And the primates have once and many times said no we're not going to have same-sex married couples in the episcopacy not going to happen and the episcopal church said screw you we're going to uh consecrate gene robinson and they did and that that tore the fabric of the communion and now justin welby is trying his best to repair that to get a, a nice long piece of thread and repair that tear it's not going to happen and well, just and this Lambda shows that, George. In a press com this afternoon's press conference, or this evening's press conference for England, uh, Archbishop Tabo Makoba, who is from South Cape Town, South Africa, and who is a liberal and has been on the inside for, gosh, 10, 15 years, uh, was asked a question uh, about uh, new bishops. And the reporter who asked the question was confused. Um, she said she asked she basically thought are you saying that that you've replaced the Nigerians and Ugandans and Rwandans with other bishops from those countries who want to come he said oh no 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 uh, what I meant by new bishops is that we have had new people consecrated and I like to think of them as a new broom that uh, sweeps cleanly so we don't have to refight all the old fights they can come into this discussion without any baggage of the past so what they're saying is that part of the lambeth strategy is to get new bishops who haven't a memory of the prior discussions and say well we're not agreed at this meeting let's carry the conversation forward unaware that this has been the uh song played on the radio for the last 20 years yeah. and there's no intention of coming to an understanding same-sex marriage has been decided as not going to happen here by Lambeth 98. 
It, we don't have to replay it. It's, it's, it's a decision. It's been done. All done. We don't have to talk about it. And if you struggle understanding that, I, I can't help you there. We're not going to change it. The, okay, let me take it forward okay, from the impasse mm -hmm. to today, Tuesday, August 2nd. Early in the morning, uh, U.S. time, the Archbishop of Canterbury released his draft uh, it released the final copy the final of this letter. letter. Mm -hmm. I don't know how different it might be from the original because I did, have not seen the original. And it's printed on Anglican ink and it essentially speaks out of both sides of its mouth at once. Um, it essentially classifies Lambeth 110 as a historical document akin to the Episcopal Church having the 39 articles and the uh, Athanasian Creed and other things stuck in the back of the book past the index which we don't have to pay attention to but we really need to have nonetheless in there. The Global South at two o'clock local time in the UK, Britain released their statement and it's the, the differences between the two are night and day. Justin Welby says lawyerly it's very uh, smarmy. The Global South statement is very clean, very straightforward. Uh, we stand upon the Bible. We will not be swayed by culture or human emotion or anecdote. As a church, we must build and maintain our faith once received and not add to it as, uh, as the whim of each generation changes. We are a church that is always reforming itself. We are a Catholic church. We are a church that stands upon the work of our forefathers. We are not going to repudiate what they did less than 22 years ago at Lambeth 98, mm -hmm. um, 24 years ago at Lambeth 98. We're going to stand on that. And so, but Justin Welby would not give them time during the session. So what they did is that the session started at 2.30 and at two o'clock, an email was sent by the Global South to the approximately 267 Global South bishops here, asking them to affirm this statement. And you could affirm it by email, where you would send an email to a secure address with essentially a picture of your photo ID, so we know it's you, they know it's you, <laughs> and that you support this. And tell us how big your diocese is or province is. Then paper copies would be placed at tables, you know, as you enter the room uh, for the plenary on the different tables that those who are not members of Global South, say you're an English or an American or a Canadian bishop, and there are some of those who are supporting of Lambeth 110, you can sign this too. But we will keep this anonymous so that there will not be retribution. So let's say you're a bishop, uh, uh, William uh, Sumner Brewer. Well, yeah, uh, so, no, so, somebody, somebody, yes. somebody from Uganda, and you don't want to lose funding from Trinity Wall Street. You are, or you're an American Communion Partners Bishop. Yeah, and you don't want to go the way Bill Love goes. Sure, you can register your vote, mm -hmm. and they will then aggregate it. Total number of province, total number of bishops, number of bishops in each province, and the size of the diocese that they represent. Uh, so, in essence, uh, both you know, they they played chicken, and uh, Justin Webby lost because we're having a vote, and it's. And now here I'm getting into a bit of commentary, because the Lambeth this Lambeth Congress is not technically having any resolutions or votes, there's nothing binding that could come out of if they had the meeting, mm -hmm. but rather this way. There'll be a clear demarcation between those who stand upon scripture and those who do not. Now they have the rest of the week, if you will, to, to add their names to this, or they can do it when they get home, or the, the Nigerians, Rwandans, Ugandans, and those Kenyans and Australians who stayed home can do it from afar. So this is an ongoing piece. Uh, let me just pursue one angle that I think is important to say. The atmosphere at Lambeth is joyful, confused, angry. Each bishop is having a unique experience. 
If you have a nice group of people at your table, you're having a wonderful time. You're praying together, you're studying the Bible together, and it really is worth the, the effort. If you've got a miserable group of people at your table, uh, it's a horrible experience. If you're on the staff at Lambeth, this has been an absolute fiasco because the one thing they did not want to have happen was for this to be all about sex. Yeah. And it's all about sex. It, it's all Let about me, Lambeth. It's about Lambeth 110. It, this, this whole conference is about one thing. And I want to back up because I probably didn't state my position clearly enough. Justin Welby in his letter says that um, some uh, provinces have come to the conclusion uh, that same-sex marriage and same-sex unions are fine after careful theological reflection. Um, and I need to, to back up and say, no, there was no careful theological uh, reflection that allowed for same-sex marriage um, and the uh, blessing and affirmation of the homosexual lifestyle. Whenever we had the theological discussions, the Windsor reports, the primate communiques, they were all completely against it. However, the Episcopal Church in Canada and some other promises says, well, the Holy Spirit is doing something different. And that's completely different than a theological even, um, discussion, George. Even in the Episcopal Church, they, when they did the theological work, the committee was divided. Yeah. There was no common voice. There was. A, this group says yes, this group says no, and it was adopted by the House of Bishops on pure party lines, mm -hmm. not on theological principles. That's uh, there are 43 provinces, uh, plus of course, uh, ACNA and uh, the Anglican Church of Brazil, mm -hmm. 43 asterisks, 45 provinces. Uh, of these 43 who are here at Lambeth, Three have same-sex marriage. That is uh, America, mm -hmm. Canada. Three have same-sex marriage and three have same-sex blessings. Mm -hmm. uh, America has same-sex marriage. Canada has same-sex blessings. Scotland has same-sex marriage. I think Wales has same-sex blessings. blessings. Brazil has same-sex blessings. And there's somebody else. I, I'll, I'll remember that That's shortly. Right. And the way it's pre presented is that the, Justin Welby's letter, for instance, of this morning, saying that these six have gone through deep theological uh, struggle, but it basically s implies that the uh, the other third uh, forty three minus six is thirty seven. <laughs> the other thirty seven. It's getting late, <laughs> The other 37 huh? are just uh, winging it or unthinking flat earth Neanderthals who have no theological basis for their opposition. And that's what's implied here. If the people who came to the conclusion that same-sex marriage is something we can bless, endorse, um, and allow as a healthy alternative to uh, heterosex marriage, the other people who have not come to that conclusion yet are Neanderthals. And haven't had that theological discussion yet. But every step along the way, Justin Welby and new viewers to the program Anglican Scripted, the primates and the Anglican Communion have spoken very loudly when they got together on this issue. Okay? There's no point, there's nothing you can point to that says there's been a theological discussion and we landed on the card that says same sex marriage is okay. But no. We only get to that card when we say, oh, but you don't understand. This is the 21st century, and the Holy Spirit is doing something new. That's what the Methodists, United Methodists, their banner says the Holy Spirit is doing something new. Uh, no. Ke Ke Kevin refutes that. Kevin calls BS on this. And, you know, we, we have so many more days left on Lambeth, George. Oh, jeez. Till Sunday. Um Today, this uh, this morning for me, this <laughs> afternoon, I uh, interviewed the Archbishop of Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Melter Teus. Mm -hmm. uh, Melter Teus is from Saba, which is North Borneo. He's the first indigenous uh, person to be bishop there. The prior bishops have all been of Chinese or English ancestry. He is what they used to call a Dayak. Uh, which once upon a time were headhunters who lived in Borneo. English is his third or fourth language. 
So the uh, our interview uh, did not produce volumes, but it was quite clear where he's coming from in his English, which is, uh, I asked him, now the uh, the the uh, leadership here at Lambeth 2022 says that you're just the Global South are stooges of Gafcon, that the Nigerians are calling the shots. Is that true? And he says, I have nothing against Gafcon, but Gafcon has got nothing to do with what we're doing here. Amen. We've been working on this for months. Yes. Yeah. And we stand as individuals, as provinces, as dioceses, as bishops on what we're saying. And what we're saying is that uh, God's word cannot be subordinated to the dictates of Scripture. As Anglicans, Scripture, tradition, and reason scripture being the major leg the largest leg the most important leg tradition 1998 is we passed this my predecessor yong ping chung was one of the key people right. in yeah. passing lambeth 98. Mm -hmm. he was bishop of saba and archbishop of southeast asia before me i am not going to repudiate the tradition of this great man uh and third human reason tells me that uh, this is the truth and our call to Ang I said well what do you want Anglicans in the United States to hear stand fast uh, he wasn't referring to a uh, website uh, <laughs> stand fast be faithful be a holy remnant in the church wherever you are and pray for the conversion of your country now these he, he's, he's someone who Malaysia Saba is a state in Malaysia and if you if you're a long-term reader of Anglican Inc you'll have read articles about how uh, Malaysian Christians have been forbidden to use the word Allah which yeah. in their Bahasa Indonesian language is God it's not Muslim Allah it's just God it, well it's Christian God too I mean too. It, it's all I mean and Bibles uh, are regularly see Bibles in in the Baha Bibles in the local language are, which are shipped to Borneo are, are intercepted by customs because they contain the word Allah and that's a Muslim word and the Muslim government in Kuala Lumpur uh, is not going to allow that. So here's somebody and there's a what I would call low level cultural as well as political prejudice and persecution of Christians. Um, this is somebody who has had to spend all of his life fighting against a hostile power and so for the Episcopal Church and the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury to threaten that, oh my goodness, we'll just have to rethink this grant that we've given you, uh, or this support that for this school that you we're supporting, that's a hard blow, but at the same time they're not going to uh, have their faith be dictated by, by uh, men when it is clearly in front of them in their own language, the words of God, Scripture. Now, the press office for the Lambeth Conference has said that there have been some erroneous reporting, and I kind of like to talk to that, um, but they won't correct it or tell you what it is um, because they said they won't speak to that because it was uh, reports from private. And having dealt with the ACNA's uh, press office, having dealt with uh, other press offices through time, including the last Lamb of 2008, the press office is there to help correct erroneous stories, to provide transparency, to say, uh, and this has happened to me with Andrew Gross, Kevin, you were not as precise as you should have been on this topic. This is what uh, you should this is a correction to the story. In fact, I got a call once from Archbishop Bob Duncan, who was a tr in a, on a train in France, who, who had just read a story we posted or something we did on Anglican Unscripted, and he called and said, y you guys got that story wrong? Uh, this is the correction. I'm talking to Bob Duncan. Oh, let me get a pen. Okay. <laughs> you know, and that's how this works. That's how the press operates. That's how Christianity works. If we find somebody in error, we help them. It, after we say, first of all, we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God, we're here to help you, and by helping you, we help ourselves. As Christian press, and I guess I can't say that about Lambeth, sorry, um, you're here to help, and we're here to help you. And, and that's, that's how, the nature of correction. 
And when you and you tell me you sent in emails and questions to the Lambeth Press uh, office asking for who's there, what bishops are there, and where are they from? What do they say, George? Oh, there are about 650. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do they have names? And, <laughs> no. And no, we won't tell you who they are or where they're from. Why? We won't tell you the names of the ecumenical guests. Why? I, uh, looking at photos, I have a good memory for faces. Sure. I saw Geraldine Wolfe, the retired bishop of Rhode Island. She's been retired for a long time with a bishop's badge. I saw uh, Jenny Anderson, the resigned bishop of Toronto, do assistant bishop, who Sister, now leads yeah. a parish uh, in um, Lower Street. What is it? Well, whatever. But it's she's a not a parish. She's, she's, she's a parish not priest. A, but she's not a bishop. Right. And I saw Bill Franklin, who retired in 19 as Bishop of Western New York. Wow. And I asked, I've seen people who are not serving bishops. They're bishops having held the office, but they're not actually working right now mm. in Episcopal duties. Why are they here? Well, there's nobody here like that. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I, I just am, you know, double check. I want to make sure I'm reading, you know, that's Geraldine Wolf. She's got a picture. There's her name tag. Yeah, that's Geraldine Wolf. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's lying, Kevin. We're dealing with uh, a very controlling entity and organization coming out of Lambeth Palace. So that most, I would say almost all the press officers have no idea what's going on up at the top level. So you They're think just it, little it, sheets the, at the top of, level, there's a cloud and mm -hmm. lot, there's a lot happening there. And you're so, you, you don't think the press office knows. And they're kind of like, well, why would you want to know who's here? You know, the, the, you think that I, cause I think it's a cover up. I think there's shadow bishops there in case they have this problem with a vote, you know, could, could very well be. Uh, and but, I'm not a conspiracy know, person. Okay, to, it, but having watched how this Lambeth and this Archbishop of Canterbury has worked th this last decade, I'm starting to be a little bit, maybe there's a conspiracy here. Well, I guess I haven't noticed Peter Akinola or Henry Arambi <laughs> uh, right. amongst the retired guests. Well, they're from Uganda and yeah, Nigeria, yeah, yeah, so yeah, they yeah. wouldn't be here, but nonetheless, you see where I'm going with that. Sure. Um, it, it's interesting. I've been threatened personally. Uh, indirectly and in a very English way. Very English. I got yes. an email. I got an email. So, uh, you know, attempt was made to scare me off. Uh, attempts have been made to quash English uh, bishops who are on the conservative side for them to stay very far and clear from any Lambeth 110 talk. That's one of the reasons why the uh, names are going to be collected anonymously because there will be repercussions. I have no career aspirations. <laughs> and unless the, and, and I'm, I'm, I've got 12 more years at this parish because I have almost essentially what they call a freehold in England, but I've got tenure. And unless the sheriff comes and takes me away for something criminal, you can't get rid of me. And making Justin Welby unhappy is not a crime under the uh, title for the Whoa, Church. Hold on, hold on. There is a video going all around Twitter and Facebook and YouTube about a retired uh, army officer in uh, Britain being arrested because he posted something that somebody else found offensive. Now, I do not want to offend anybody at Lambeth, especially the Archbishop of Canterbury, or certainly a, a uh, um, citizen of Britain, uh, because you can be arrested if you offend somebody. I don't know if you saw that video, George. You've been busy. Yes, but here I, I'm in uh, good old sunny Florida where um, the police don't arrest people who offend people. They arrest uh, people who stick up liquor stores or burglars. Uh, in uh, fact, uh, in yeah. fact, Kevin, the big news, did you hear about in Webster, your new hometown? Police raided a cockfighting ring last night and arrested 12 men and with their roosters. Oh no! This is the yeah. This, <laughs> this is, is the big I, stuff, Kevin. I'm, you're lucky you're out of town, or you would have been scooped up by the uh, sheriff's department. Well, and, and here I want my listeners to to our listeners to to hear. I'm going to give a compliment to President Obama. Uh, he did some good things. He did many bad things. Um, in fact, you're witnessing right now the woke bad things he started. But 
President Obama signed a law that makes it so people from around the world can't use Britain courts to sue other American people for uh, libel, slander, and all those laws. And we know this because people have tried to sue us and used English courts to do so. And this little Obama law says you can't do that. We can't be sued from around the world using the very liberal English courts, George. Well, at the primates meeting in Dramantine, Frank Griswold, this is going back 15, 20 years, uh, was so incensed by my reporting that he complained to John Howe. And John Howe said, in only the way John Howe can do it, so what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> um, so, uh, because I had done nothing wrong, and sure. everything I reported was the truth. Well, what, what are the substance of these lies that uh, Lambeth Palace, the Lambeth Conference hasn't put out anything? Lambeth Palace put out a statement uh, about in response to our story about the Saturday night meeting, mm -hmm. where confirming uh, that they had met, but then said, well, he meets with a lot of people. And no, we can't talk about the substance. But we're very disappointed uh, because uh, we, uh, the participants gave just in their word that they would not tell anybody what they talked about. And essentially what that was, was a way to split me and my, from my sources and the Global South primates from each other who's talking and who's leaking and this mm -hmm. and that. And then there was an article in the Church Times this morning about the Lambeth Conference, which list names Anglican Inc. by name uh, as the people doing this, where again, it repeats the uh, the uh, canard that uh, we've violated, uh, you know, we've engaged in ungentlemanly behavior. I gotta tell you, Kevin, when that's as hard as they can hit back, that I'm not being a gentleman, I got no worries. No, okay. I well, and it shouldn't be this way, but Christian reporting in the age of 2022 is difficult. We get threatened a lot. We uh, we have people threaten us with lawsuits way too often, and we have people who uh, feed us bad stories as well. You know, it's not just that we get fed real stories, and uh, even within the context of the liberals and the conservatives, in all that's happening, we also get fed the dirt between the liberals who are fighting or between conservatives who are fighting. And we have to kind of, you know, work out what's a real story, what's interesting to the Anglican.inc and Anglican scripted audience, and what's going to be, at the end of the day, something redeemable. I think Lambeth 2022 is redeemable. You only got a couple of days left, but I think, well, you know, it, it, it's a redeemable situation, George. There have been some moments of clarity in the fog bank here at press conferences. Um, as I mentioned, individual bishops on the ground are not really good indicators because you have to sort of step back and step up and look down and meld uh, all the different conversations that are going on. And one of the great things about this conference is Twitter. Where so many bishops take to Twitter and discuss what they're thinking and seeing and doing. And so you really do get a greater sampling or sounding as well as the good old cell phone and calling people um, or emailing or texting or Skyping or WhatsApping, all that stuff. But Tim Fortin at the press conference, I've asked him a few questions that he's answered straightforward. I asked, uh, we mentioned the, the comment about uh, Justin Welby answered the question, what is the central unit of the church? It's the diocese, not the province. Uh, I said, I asked him the other day, I asked Tim Thornton, who was leading the conference, uh, leading the press conference uh, in 2007, uh, Justin Welby said Lambeth conferences have no juridical authority, but they have a moral authority. Is that still true? And his one word answer was yes. Lambeth conferences don't have uh, legislative authority or moral authority. And in the church, moral authority often Trump's, is more powerful it's, it's than juridical authority. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, Mark Hill, a, a noted canon lawyer, 
said, you know, the the idea that Lambeth 110 can restrict or bind anybody is ridiculous because Lambeth is not a uh, legislature. Well, nobody's really ever said that it was. And it's one of the mistakes that lawyers make is that they think law, because if something is legal, it's good. You know, that's not the way the church works. Mm -hmm. The second thing that Tim Thornton said, um, and I do want to pull out some of my notes, uh, which, of course, when I need them, I can't find. Well, you're tired. Uh, it's probably right uh, in front of your face, and you, uh, uh, you've you been know, up is since... Is my handwriting, or did the chicken have epilepsy uh -huh. and stepped uh -huh. in some ink? I can't tell. Okay, but what I wanted to mention was that... Uh, what is what is the Lambeth Conference? And he responded, the Lambeth Conference is a conference, meaning we confer... It is not designed to make clear statements about anything. Now, let's think about that. Yeah. Oof, well. It's the first half. Yeah, we confer. It's a conference. Yeah, I understand etymology of words. But it's purposely designed this time around not to come to a clear decision on anything. So you ask yourself, what's the point of this multi-million dollar operation? Um... It's, I think that's a very telling, uh, I think that's a self-inflicted wound. Because we're told that Lambeth doesn't mean anything. The votes that aren't votes, but they're called votes in the sessions, don't mean anything. What you tell the table is collected and filed, and somebody might look at it someday, but it really doesn't matter. Um, the Archbishop and the conference oh, you've approved this language that is some dodgy language about the Trinity. Oh, well, don't worry. We're going to fix everything up anyway after the fact. But we'll clean it in the, in the mix. Yeah, and yeah. but that's, in my mind, that's what makes Lambeth, for the Anglican Communion, an extinction-level event. We get mm -hmm. everybody together who wears purple, we try to anyway, and we can't decide anything. We can't, we can't come to any decisions on anything. We can't agree on things we've agreed to in the past. Well, it's a little too strong because we have agreed on some stuff. We've agreed, uh, the bishops have agreed, but no vote tally was taken. Oh, it's know. just a show of hands or <laughs> whoever shouted loudest. So we are told they that, agree. Yeah, and basically Justin Welby thinks that they agree. He's mm -hmm. the one who decides who's louder, who has more hands, who's, who's standing, who's seated, you know. Uh, well... Uh, they want the church commissioners of the Church of England, which has uh, several billion pounds in assets, to pay reparations to the descendants of uh, West African slaves. Yeah, that's really going to happen. I got to tell you, that's, you know, how in God's name are they going to compel the church commissioners who are independent, even though the Archbishop of Canterbury is the chairman of the church commissioners, they are independent fiduciary agents. Mm. Are they going to turn over money? No, of course not. Well, no, no, they will, but it will just be for show. I mean, they'll, you know, they, they will turn over money to some type of organization that helps find the people who needs the money. You know. Yeah, I mean, so it. There'll be. You're right, Kevin. I misspoke. There will be some sort of token. Yes, payments, absolutely. But, yeah. Or they want to have an Anglican Congress. There have been mm -hmm. two: one in London in 1908, and one in Toronto in 1963 each having about fifteen to 20,000 people attend, lay people, clergy, bishops. They want to have another Anglican Congress somewhere in the Global South. Well, you said 19. This would be 20. Yeah. The next, That's, well, there was one in 1908, and there was uh, one in 1962. Okay. And they want another one. Another one. Okay. Got it. Somewhere in the Global South. Mm -hmm. Did they do anything to pay for this? And would that no. be legislative? Yeah, and okay. because they have no, they cannot tax, they cannot gather money, they can ask for money. Mm -hmm. But think about it this way, uh, a Lambeth, what would a Lambeth, Congre uh, an Anglican Congress look like? Mm -hmm. It would be the upper middle classes from around the world jetting to some exotic destination because they can buy the ticket and pay the hotel bill. Shh, Whereas a, a an African or a, an Indian or you know someone from a least less developed country 
you know, how are they going to participate with equal voice? George, you had the, the perfect uh, opportunity to add the words white privileged to our program, and you didn't. Well, I think that's nonsense, <laughs> but you, know, you can use it as a club. Go ahead. Yes, use yes, it. Yeah. <laughs> There's an essay that uh, we've reprinted on Anglican Inc. about uh, white privilege in Lambeth. Uh, essentially, the um, in English history, there was something called a rotten borough in Parliament, mm -hmm. where over the course of the centuries, a... Uh, geographic area that had one time in the medieval times had been a thriving town that sent somebody to parliament had over the course of the centuries dwindled down to a half dozen farmers they still had as many they still had a member of parliament where something like the city of manchester or birmingham which appeared out of nowhere with a million people may have had one member of parliament and parliament was thoroughly unrepresented uh, in of the people manchester, of England yeah. because because of these historical anomalies. There are rotten borough dioceses. Uh, the Diocese of Brecon in uh, the north of Scotland has 673 people on a Sunday. Well, well, the Diocese Michigan. of Northern Michigan, Northern yeah, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. And, you know, and these rotten borough dioceses are all in the West. Um, and so American and Canadian and Scottish, there are 15,000 Welsh Anglicans for, for six bishops at Lambeth. Uh, there are 15,000 Anglicans in Central Florida. There are 100,000 Anglicans and Episcopalians in Texas, Diocese mm -hmm. of Texas. How, and more, I would think at least more than 15,000 at the Diocese of the Gulf Atlantic of the ACNA. And so there's the way the Lambeth Conference and the Young Consultative Council is set up is to enshrine white liberal privilege because those who have the money and can create dioceses and do all this and that can and do call the shots out of sheer numbers. All right, so let's finish up here. We've got like five minutes before we hit the hour. You need to go back, go to sleep, shower and get up by two again um so quickly let's talk about the autonomy of the province or the diocese uh, there's a uh, article you put up uh, that had uh, uh, a discussion about this and i'm like it it doesn't make sense to me but i'm not roman catholic i can't describe what the perfect angle solution is but pure raw autonomy uh, as described by some at, at Lambeth, is not what we're looking for in the future of Anglicanism, George. Well, there's a large degree of hypocrisy here. The Episcopal Church as an institution wants autonomy. It does not want to be responsible uh, to uh, other members of the communion mm -hmm. and defer to their, defer to the group's views. But when you have the Diocese of South Carolina raise the same arguments the Episcopal Church has raised in relation to the communion, the Episcopal Church says, uh, 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 you're a subsidiary of us, you're a franchise, you're like the McDonald's store in this town, and headquarters is in Chicago. Well, that, of course, is untrue. And that's one of the reasons the lawsuits we had for years and problems with our Episcopal, uh, civil courts is that some states, Texas, Illinois, recognize the autonomy of the diocese. Some states, California, New York, uh, said no. And then South Carolina said yes, then no, then now maybe. Uh, yeah, South Carolina Supreme just, Court, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just total mishmash. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, the, the liberals want it both ways. They want to be severe, and can have conformity amongst their ranks they want bill the bill loves to sit down shut up do what they're told but when it comes to the wider anglican communion they want to have their consciences protected mm -hmm. so that they can do what they think is right bill love or george sumner or greg brewer or john bauer Ch Schmidt, charles holt Char uh, charlie holt charlie holt yeah Sam Howard, uh, all these guys, their consciences cannot be their guide. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the general convention must be their guide. But when the Episcopal Church is at this level, we must allow our consciousness to be our guide. So it, it's... You sound like Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> well, yes, but it, the Episcopal ecclesiology... Yes. The, the Episcopal Church of the USA ecclesiology is dreadful. Mm -hmm. It's dreadful. We have a dysfunctional, well, it's like the General Convention, where Navajo land has as many delegates and deputies and, and bishops as, uh, you know, Central Florida or Texas or so. Well, Texas has suffragan bishops, but, you know, it's just the, the, the point being is if we're, if we are, as the 815 people say, a representative church where democracy rules and 50% one plus one makes things the law, then you need to have proportional representation. Right. If like, we're a uh, fellowship, if we're a fellowship of equal dioceses, that we can accept or reject what's being handed to us because we have a degree of independence that uh, and are modeled on the Articles of Confederation from American history. If you remember your eighth grade history, not the U.S. Constitution, which is how the U.S. Episcopal Church Constitution is modeled in the Articles of Confederation. Mm -hmm. um, then it's it's nonsense the arguments put forward by 815 but of course uh, that's been tried in courts and those with good states and deep pockets have prevailed those with bad bad courts and shallow pockets have lost the holy spirit is not doing something new i'm kevin Carlson, and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 700 and 47 of Anglican Unscripted.